Hello everyone, um, this is part two of the uh, photosynthesis series <clears throat> and in this video we are going to talk about the Calvin cycle or I, as I like to refer to them, the light independent reactions. We're also going to talk a bit about the way that environmental conditions affect um, photosynthesis and more importantly how they affect the Calvin cycle and uh, sequestering CO2 from the environment and converting it into um, a carbohydrate. And then the last thing that we're going to talk about is um, a few ways that uh, plants have tricked um, the uh, mechanism of converting uh, CO2 into glucose into working better as a result of this process that is pretty harmful to them that's called photorespiration. Um, so I'll just start with uh, an overview to, to remind you, bring you back to the equation of photosynthesis. Um, just remember that we start with CO2 and we need water. And those two reactants are converted using light and enzymes into uh, C6H12O6 and um, oxygen. And that whole process, which is pretty complex, happens in two stages. We already went over the light reactions, um, so if you need a, a reminder of how that works, please go back to part one of the photosynthesis series. And um, the second stage of photosynthesis um, is the Calvin cycle, or the light independent reactions. Um, so I just want to remind you, photosynthesis is an endergonic reaction, meaning that it does require energy. Um, in order to occur, and that energy is coming in um, in the form of, of light from, from the sun, typically. Um, so here is um, a diagram just showing you the flow of energy. And what we'll see is um, we start with light, and light is what will be used by um, plants in order to power the light reactions that are going on in the thylakoids of the chloroplasts. And the light reactions are a set of reactions that produce ATP and NADPH um, as a result of um, uh, wavelengths of light exciting electrons on um, different pigment molecules that are stuck in the thylakoid membrane. And the pigment molecules are in two systems. They're called photosystem 2 and photosystem 1. The electrons on the photosystems are excited. They're sent down a long cascade of different um, cytochrome proteins. And it's because of the movement from one protein, cytochrome protein, to another that we're able to power the movement of hydrogen ions from one side of the thylakoid membrane to another side of the thylakoid membrane and in doing that we produce a gradient and that gradient can then power ATP synthase which um, is going to be where we produce an energy reserve of ATP that we'll then be able to use to power the Calvin cycle that's going on in the stroma to convert CO2 into organic compounds. So we're converting inorganic material like CO2 into organic material like carbohydrates. So this long process um, is extremely important, um, but one thing I really want to emphasize again is that energy is not made in this process. It's simply transformed and um, it is each of, each of those boxes that we have, the light and the ATP, the NADPH and the organic compounds, they all contain energy. Those molecules contain energy, but they're, they're, in, um, they're just in a different form. So photosynthesis in, in general is a process that converts energy from an unusable form, like light, into a usable form like organic compounds. And in order to do that, uh, it actually requires an intermediate step, and that step it involves the production of ATP and NADPH. Um, so this is just an overview of the ways that the uh, products of the light reaction are used to then power uh, 
um, some steps in the light independent reaction reactions. Um, and all of this, of course, is going on inside the chloroplasts of the of the cell, of the plant cells. Um, so we'll call this phase two. Phase one was the light dependent reactions. Phase two is the Calvin cycle or the light independent reactions. And it's in the Calvin cycle that this chemical energy um, from the light reactions that, that came from the um, light reactions, the chemical energy that's stored in ATP and the NADPH, and CO2 that's coming into the, the plant from the atmosphere, those things are, are used to produce the organic compounds um, that we have at the end of photosynthesis. So the, the end product of photosynthesis is the production of organic compounds like glucose. Um, but all of this, the Calvin cycle that we have is going on inside the stroma of the chloroplasts. And you'll see two images at the bottom. The one on the left hand side is a um, is the structure of glucose. And glucose has six carbons, um, 12 hydrogens, six oxygens. And it follows the same ratio for all carbohydrates, the one to two to one carbon hydrogen oxygen ratio. That's um, that is the makes up the definition of what a carbohydrate is. And the second image that we'll see is just the general depiction of what um, a chloroplast looks like, a cross section of a chloroplast. And um, the reactions of the Calvin cycle are actually going on outside of the thylakoids and in the stroma. So they're contained within the inner membrane of the uh, chloroplast, but they're not in the these reactions aren't going on inside the thylakoid. Um, so the Calvin cycle actually stop, starts with the process known as carbon fixation. And um, carbon fixation is a, is a pretty important term. And that term simply means that we are assimilating carbon. We're taking up carbon from a non-organic compound. That could be um, carbon dioxide. And we are changing it in some way, we're incorporating it into an, organ or in an organic compound, um, such as carbohydrates. So when we say carbon fixation, what we're saying is that we're taking something that is uh, inorganic, a non-organic compound like CO2, and we're converting it through a series of reactions um, into an organic compound. And basically what we're doing is we're taking the carbon from the inorganic compound and we're fixing it or we're affixing it um, onto an already existing organic compound. So we're basically just appending the carbon from uh, the carbon dioxide onto um, a set of uh, a string of carbon uh, atoms that we already have inside the, inside the plant. Um, so one big thing that I, I do want you to realize is that uh, CO2 is not an organic compound. And the reason why it's not considered to be an organic compound is because it doesn't have hydrogen. And organic compounds are always uh, made of, a, up of at least carbon and hydrogen. So uh, that is why we consider CO2 as, as to be something that is inorganic. So the first step is, like I said, carbon fixation. Here's what's here's what's going on. Um, we the plant will take in three molecules of uh, CO2 from the atmosphere through the stomata, the the openings underneath the the bottom side of the leaf, and those three molecules of CO2 are bound to three molecules that already exist inside the uh, stro uh, the stroma of the plant that are called uh, RUBP and RUBP is a five carbon sugar. So what you'll see in the in the diagram below is that we have three carbon um, atoms and I haven't included the oxygen or the hydrogen or any of that stuff um, on the on the diagrams because I, I feel like it's easier if only the carbons are shown just for for clarity. So the carbon atoms that you see in red and the ones that you see in black are identical. 
um, but I color-coded them so that you knew where they came from. The red, of course, are the ones that are from the CO2 in the atmosphere, and the black carbons that you see make up the carbons in the molecule called RUBP. So carbon fixation starts with um, the three molecules of carbon dioxide being added to, being appended to, three molecules of RUBP. And the enzyme that's doing that is known as Rubisco. And Rubisco is um, the enzyme that allows the carbon dioxide molecules to be added to the RUBP. The enzyme's name, Rubisco, comes from the, the full name of it is RUBP carboxylase, which is um, descriptive, actually, in terms of what it's doing. It is carboxylasing, it is adding a carboxyl group to the RUBP molecule. And so um, this enzyme is starting off the process of carbon fixation. We take inorganic material, CO2, and we add it to something that could be considered organic. That's called RUBP. Um, and uh, one thing I do want you to know is R uh, RUBP, the long uh, form of that name, is ribulose biphosphate. It's just an abbreviated, um, the abbreviation is the, is the one that's always used. One quick thing that I'd, I want you to know is that um, we're starting with the starting material for this reaction before the CO2 is incorporated is we're starting with 15 carbon atoms. Um, and so we have uh, five carbon sugar and we have three of them. So the starting material is 15 carbons. Um, and we produce something that looks like this where we have three six-carbon molecules at the end of this reaction. So after Rubisco adds the CO2 to the RUBP, we get these uh, three six-carbon molecules. The next step is called the reduction phase. And in the reduction phase, we basically we take these three six-carbon molecules that are very unstable, and uh, we split them in half. And by splitting them in half, we're actually forming uh, six three-carbon molecules. And um, uh, what's going on is uh, two, two things. We are um, reducing the molecules uh, by gaining electrons from the NADPH. So the NADPH is being oxidized to become NAD+. And in that oxidation reaction, the electrons that are being lost by, by the NADPH are actually being donated to the, um, the six carbon uh, molecules. And then the six carbon molecules are additionally being phosphorylated by the ATP that we've produced in the light reaction. So what are the products of the light reactions? That would be the phase one part of photosynthesis. The light reaction produces ATP and NADPH at the end. And it is in this step here, the step two, the reduction phase, that we're using the ATP that we produced and the NADPH that we produced um, from, from the light reactions. So I'll just review. The three six carbon molecules are being broken down to allow them to become more stable. In that process, they get reduced and they gain the electrons that are lost by NADPH when it's converted to NAD+, and they are phosphorylated by ATP, and the, uh, we produce ADP as a result. And that uh, ATP is actually required for the molecular rearrangement. Um, for the for the reshuffling of the the structure of the molecules themselves, <clears throat> and we produce something that looks like this. Just remember, uh, the color does not uh, matter. It's just meant to show you where that carbon atom uh, came from. Um, by the way, the question 
uh, above here it says where did the NADPH and the ATP come from to do this I already answered that question um, but the answer again is is from the light reactions those two things are the products of the light reactions and that was the phase one of photosynthesis so now there are six uh, three carbon molecules and the names that we give for those six three car carbon molecules we call them G3P or sometimes we call them PGAL, uh, P-G-A-L, PGAL. Um, and uh, what's going to go on is that since the Calvin cycle started with 15 carbons, or uh, we started with three um, five carbon molecules, and now we have um, six three carbon molecules, so six times three means we have 18 carbons in total, we can see that we have a net gain of a total of three carbons. And uh, what's going to happen is one of those extra three carbon G3P uh, molecules will actually exit the cycle and it will be used to form half of a glucose molecule. Because uh, like we said, glucose is made up of six carbons in total. So if one of the six of these carbon molecules that were formed after the reduction phase, if one of these leaves, that will make up uh, one half of a glucose molecule. And remember, the, the, uh, the product, the end product of uh, photosynthesis we want is um, glucose. So we're going to take one of these uh, carbons, this, the three carbon molecules, and that's going to exit the, the cycle it's going to be used to make up the glucose. And um, if one of those exits, now let's count the number of carbons we have left. As a result, we have 3, 6, 9, 12, and then we have 15 in total. And just remember that at the beginning of the Calvin cycle, we had 15 carbons. So with this one leaving, we're left with the same starting material in terms of the number of carbons that we had. We're back to the beginning. And this whole cycle can go again. So in order for us to get six, carbon, uh, six carbons that can leave the Calvin cycle, this process needs to happen twice. It'll happen one time. We'll get these six three-carbon molecules. One of the six three-carbon molecules will leave the cycle and then it'll happen again. We'll get another set of six three carbon molecules. Then we'll have one of them uh, leave. That will be the second three carbon molecule to leave. And after the second three carbon molecule will, uh, leaves, we will then have enough carbon atoms to produce one molecule of glucose. And that cycle can continue happening over and over and over again until we um, stop bringing in carbon dioxide and stop reduction. So each turn of the Calvin cycle will produce uh, one new molecule of G3P or uh, the other term we use is PGAL. And every time we do this cycle twice, um, those, six those two molecules of G3P will combine to form one molecule of glucose, a six carbon uh, carbohydrate molecule or some other organic compound that, that could potentially uh, be formed. And when we say that the Calvin cycle turns twice to make one molecule of glucose, in reality it's turning six times. And, and that may seem confusing at first, but let me try and try and explain what that means. Um, each entering carbon dioxide molecule represents one turn of the, type, the cycle. And so we need six carbon dioxide molecules that are, that they need to be incorporated into organic compounds in order for one full six carbon glucose molecule to be produced. So if we need the same starting material at the beginning of the, the Calvin cycle, and that is we need at least 15 carbons, then every time that turn happens, we need to end with 15 carbons in order to maintain the, the cycle. If we don't have 15, then the cycle can't continue. So in reality, in order for us to get um, one molecule of glucose, 
we have to turn the Calvin cycle six times. It needs to happen six times. Each entering carbon dioxide molecule represents one turn of the cycle, and therefore six carbon dioxide molecules must be incorporated into organic compounds in order to produce a one carbon glucose molecule at the end. Um, so, glucose is what we usually think of as being the major product of photosynthesis. However, G3P, or the PGA, like I said, is the real product. And, um, and though it's often used to make glucose, it can also be used as a carbon skeleton to form other types of organic uh, molecules. That could be uh, fatty acids, or amino acids, uh, or um, nucleic acids. So all of these, uh, the, the real, the true end product of photosynthesis is G3P or PGAL. And um, uh, the reason for that is because we don't always end with a molecule of glucose being produced. Uh, but typically, the way it's usually explained is that, yes, the end product of photosynthesis is glucose, but that's not always the case. It's just uh, what's typically used to describe the, the process. So how do we regenerate the RUBP to be able to uh, have this cycle go on again? Um, it, it involves a couple uh, steps. The remaining five three three GP uh, G three P molecules, those uh, molecules that are made up of three carbons each, they need to get rearranged. And when we rearrange those uh, five th uh, G three P molecules, we need to use ATP. And when we when we use ATP, we can then form those three molecules. And uh, the basic re excuse me, the basic reaction will be that we take five of the G3P molecules made up of 15 carbons. We dephosphorylate, we remove the phosphate group, an enzyme is, is basically uh, what will allow us to do that, but that enzyme requires ATP. So when we do that, we get uh, ADP and an organic phosphate as a result. And then at the end, what we will have is uh, the exact same thing that we started with, and that will be the uh, three molecules of a five carbon um, uh, molecule. And that will be, uh, then we'll be back in, in, the, in the game to start the Calvin cycle again. Back to where we started. Um, and the ATP that's required to do this arranging, where do you think it comes from? Of course, it comes from the light reaction. So it comes from the chemiosmotic gradient that was set up during the, the light reactions. So let's look at this overview. Here's what's going on. We have, of course, the RUBP in the Calvin cycle. That's, that's always got to be there. If it's not there, then the Calvin cycle can't happen. We take in CO2, and Rubisco adds the CO2 to the RUBP molecules that's in the Calvin cycle. That's always there. Um, so we have CO2 being added to those th three molecules of CO2 being added to the three molecules of the five, uh, five carbon um, starting material that we have. And through the, um, through the oxidation of the NADPH, we have, um, we form NAD plus, and through the dephosphorylation of the ATP, we actually phosphorylate some of the, the uh, products as they go around the Calvin cycle. Um, and the NADPH and the ATP are the energy molecules that are used to turn the cycle, that are used to turn this Calvin cycle. And the, we are left with, at the end of the cycle, organic compounds, such as uh, the G3P or the PGAL. And um, that is really the end of photosynthesis. So you can see here a, a pretty complex diagram that shows what's going on with the Calvin cycle. Uh, but what I want to state is that you don't need to memorize the steps of, in the Calvin cycle. The struc structures of the molecules, the names of the enzymes involved, of course, except for Rubisco and the ATP synthase, uh, you don't need to memorize any of the other stuff. 
So um, this may help you understand the process in a little bit uh, in a better way, but just know that you don't need to to memorize the enzyme names. You just need to know basically what's going on in this process. So as a quick recap, in the Calvin cycle, energy and electrons from the light reactions um, and carbon dioxide from the atmosphere are uh, being used to produce organic compounds. And so this process is happening in the stroma of the chloroplasts inside cells. CO2, ATP, and NADPH, of course, are required reactants. Um, and the products of the, the Calvin cycle is um, G3P. That's an organic compound. And so, um, just as a just as a recap, um, here's basically what's what's going on. Um, I want you to think of uh, one of the most important things in order for photosynthesis to to start. That's light, and of course the job of the light is to excite the electrons during the light reactions. And we also need H2O. What's H2O doing? It is being split during the light reactions in order to replace electrons that are lost from photosystem 2. We also need carbon dioxide, and of course the carbon dioxide is what is providing the carbon source to produce organic compounds during the Calvin cycle. And um, a byproduct of, of doing that is actually the production of oxygen. And it is due to splitting water during the light reactions. So when we take this H2O and we split it to replace those lost electrons, the byproduct of splitting that, the byproduct of the reactions of photolysis, is this water. And so we get that uh, breathed out, and luckily for us, that, that happens, but it's really a byproduct of the photosynthetic pathway. It's really not a major component of it, uh, but for us, of course, we would not be alive if we didn't have it. Then the last thing is, of course, the C6H1206, and that is the organic compound that's ultimately produced during the Calvin cycle, um, and that is the, the high energy source uh, molecule, the high energy source molecule that we have um, available to the plant to then be able to uh, produce lots and lots of ATP um, for the plant to then undergo cell respiration, uh, just like we do. So one, one big thing that I uh, think is important is that the rate of photosynthesis um, can be measured using uh, a couple things. So we can measure it um, by uh, decreasing the environmental CO2 in a, in a closed system. And if we decrease the environmental CO2, we'd expect to see a decrease in the amount of glucose that we have being produced. If we increase the environmental O2 in a closed system, uh, what do you think we would expect to see happen as a result? Um, that, that is a question that I uh, want you to think about. You might see that question on a test. Um, so I'm not going to give you the answer, but what I'd like for you to do is try and figure out what would happen if we wanted to measure the rate of photosynthesis um, and we increased the amount of environmental O2. Um, and then the last thing, what, happened, what would happen if um, we saw an increase in glucose? If we saw an increase in glucose, what would that tell us about the rate of photosynthesis? That would tell us that photosynthesis is also increasing because the more glucose we have produced at the end, um, the more photosynthesis has occurred. And so um, 
what I want to do is uh, I'm just going to post this video about the Calvin cycle so that you can watch it. Um, it's just a recap of everything that we've talked about so far, but I think it, it puts it into perspective and really helps, uh, helps you understand um, what is going on with all the CO2 molecules and how they're incorporating into the RUBP to form um, the G3P or the PGAL. Same thing for this video. Um, it really talks about uh, photosynthesis from the light reactions to the light independent reactions and and I think it, put it, put it puts it nicely into perspective. This is just a, an overall diagram explaining um, the, the ways in which the products of the light reactions are used to power the Calvin cycle, which is the conversion of uh, CO2 and the um, G3P, uh, I'm sorry, the RUBP into G3P. Um, to then be uh, turned into sucrose or glucose. And that's the, the Calvin cycle. So there are a couple, what, we, what we're gonna talk about to finish out the video is um, some alternative carbon fixing pathways and the ways in which different environmental conditions can influence the efficiency and the way that the Calvin cycle works. So what I really would like for you to focus on is the way that light intensity affects photosynthesis, the way that temperature might affect photosynthesis, and the way that environmental availability affects um, photosynthesis. Um, and because environments differ so greatly, so do some of the, the pathways that uh, plants use in order to photosynthesize. And we'll talk about the difference between the ways that C3 plants photosynthesize, C4 plants photosynthesize, and CAM plants. And um, it's kind of cool in terms of uh, how they've gained these adaptations over millions of years of evolution. So it's uh, the three ways in which environmental factors affect photosynthesis are fairly straightforward in terms of what's going on. But light intensity, as it increases, we'd expect uh, to see um, a, correlate, uh, a correlation in terms of the rate of photosynthesis. We'd expect to see an increase in the rate of photosynthesis. And this really occurs due to an increased excitation of the electrons in the photosystems. So with more light comes more wavelengths. With more wavelengths of light come um, an increase in the amount of um, electrons that are, that are being excited in the photosystems. However, what we see start to happen after um, we increase light intensity is that the rate of photosynthesis starts to level out. And the reason we say that it becomes saturated really. Um, and the reason why we can, uh, why this makes sense is um, for a couple reasons. And, and here's uh, the, the example that I'm going to give. I want you to think of a sponge and if a sponge is fully saturated with water, it can be left in a bucket of water overnight, and it's not going to gain any more water. And so in the same way, the electrons in the photosystems can be excited more often as light intensity increases. But eventually, um, a maximum rate of excitation is going to be achieved. And... Increasing that light intensity any more is s simply not going to yield an increase in photosynthetic, uh, in, in the photosynthetic rate. And that's because we've excited those photosystems to the extent that they can be excited. We can't excite them anymore. And they are um, basically moving as fast as they can. We've reached the limit in terms of how fast they can move. And so we say that they're fully saturated. And we're not going to see any further increase in the, that rate, even with an increase in light intensity. So there is an extent to, to which we can apply light to speed up the process of photosynthesis. And um, we call that point the light saturation point. It's the point in the graph where we see a plateau. Um, another environmental factor that typically we see affects uh, photosynthesis is temperature. 
And if you look at this graph here, you'll see the rate of photosynthesis on the Y, temperature on the X. We'd see typically, uh, for a lot of plants, the, um, the optimal uh, temperature is around, um, I'd say, 25 to 30 degrees Celsius. And temperature really does have, have a lot of effect on the rate of photos photosynthesis. And the real reason for that is the, because it's linked to the action of enzymes. And if we think all of the processes that are going on in the light-dependent and light-independent reactions of photosynthesis, they're all due to the work of enzymes. And if uh, you think back to the, the lab that we had with enzymes, you'd realize that as we increase temperature, um, we also increase the movement of molecules. But with that, we also start affecting the structure and function of enzymes. And the reason is because enzymes are 3D proteins. And they have multiple levels of structure. And the, the proteins are subject to external uh, stresses. And so if we think of the different levels of the structure of, of enzymes and proteins, we have primary proteins, that's when we have the peptide bonds, we have se a secondary structures, and that's when we have hydrogen bonds and alpha and beta pleated sheets. We have tertiary structures, and that's when we have these structures that look almost globular in nature. They're 3D, three-dimensional, they have uh, multiple aspects, and we have um, uh, disulfide bridges, and we have um, various interactions between R groups. And then we have quaternary structures, and that's when we have multiple different um, uh, tertiary and secondary and primary um, uh, proteins all coming together to form a, a very large, uh, complex um, 3D protein. And so with the increased rate of molecular motion as the temperature increases, we see that uh, the process of denaturation on the protein structure and the resultant loss of molecular fu function also increases. So as the molecules move faster, as we increase the temperature, so does the, um, uh, the, the denaturation of uh, enzymes. And so there is a capping point in terms of the temperature. We can increase it to a certain extent to help those enzymes work, but once we hit that point where enzymes start to become denatured, uh, photosynthesis can't happen anymore and, and we see that it doesn't it doesn't work anymore and so um, one thing that I do want to emphasize is that the specific functions and names of enzymes don't need to be memorized except for a few that I, I think are really important and do typically uh, end up on the AP test ATP synthase is a super important one. That one appears not only in photosynthesis, but also in cell respiration. And that's that transmembrane protein that is reliant upon a chemiosmotic gradient that then powers, um, that then is used to convert ADP and inorganic phosphate into ATP. Robisco, or RUBP carboxylase, is also one of those really important enzymes that a lot of times do end up on the AP test. Another one, for example, NAD plus reductase, that one is um, the enzyme that's used in the light reactions of photosynthesis and also is, is one that typically appears in the AP test. So there are some enzymes that you should know about, but in terms of the, the minute ones that are used to convert one transition um, molecule into another in the, in the Calvin cycle or in the Krebs cycle or whatever cycle it is that we're talking about, you really don't need to know the names of those. They'll be given to you if you need to use them to identify something. And then the last um, thing that we are going to talk about in terms of uh, affecting um, environmental factors uh, affecting the way that photosynthesis works is um, the oxygen concentration. And oxygen concentration is actually an important um, environmental factor that can be either extremely detrimental to a plant, uh, that can be detrimental to a plant. And so as we see that the increase, with the increase in oxygen, the rate of photosynthesis actually decreases. And the reason for that is um, due to a phenomenon that's known as photorespiration. So that's what I'll describe to you right now. Photorespiration is when the enzyme Rubisco joins oxygen 
to the starting material in the in the um, the Calvin cycle, uh, the RUBP in the first step of the Calvin cycle, rather than uh, adding carbon dioxide to the RUBP. And the reason it adds the enzyme adds oxygen instead of carbon dioxide is just dependent on whichever compound, the oxygen or the CO2, is present in higher concentration. So if oxygen is, is in a higher concentration, then Rubisco will add that to RUBP. If CO2 is in a higher concentration, then CO2 will be added to the RUBP. And that phenomenon uh, is known as photorespiration, and that is what prevents the synthesis of glucose and utilizes the plant's ATP. The reason why it utilizes the plant's ATP is because Rubisco requires ATP in order to work. And if Rubisco is adding oxygen to RUBP, it's not going to produce any glucose, um, but it's still going to use up that ATP in order to produce this oxygen plus RUBP molecule. So you can see the, the flow diagram at the bottom. More CO2 means that uh, CO2 is going to be added to the RUBP, photosynthesis is going to occur, and glucose will be produced at the, as an end product. If more O2 is present, then Rubisco is going to add the O2 to the RUBP. Photorespiration is going to occur, and as a result, glucose is not going to be produced. So photorespiration is seen as something very negative for photosynthetic organisms. And um, it's all due to the fact that photorespiration, photorespiration prevents the synthesis of glucose, and it uses up the plant's ATP. And why does this happen? It's primarily occurring for plants that are under water stress or plants that don't have enough water in order to um, do the processes of photosynthesis. And so when they're under a lot of stress, a lot of times their stomata will close and that is done to prevent water loss. So it's just an active homeostasis that plants undergo in order to prevent water loss through transpiration. However, when the stomata are closed, yes, water loss is decreased, but also um, that will increase the amount of O2 that's um, being stored inside the plant. Because O2 is typically, uh, when it's produced in the light reactions, it's uh, allowed to leave through the stomata and goes to the, um, to the environment from the plant to... To the atmosphere. But when the stomata is closed because the plants want to prevent water loss, that O2 stays in high concentrations inside the plant. And in addition, CO2 is not allowed to enter the leaf since those stomata are closed. And um, as the CO2 is being used up in the Calvin cycle and not replenished, the concentration of CO2 is decreasing. So we see um, for good reason uh, that a plant might close their stomata, but as a result of that, you increase concentration of O2 and decrease the amount of CO2 that can be brought into the cell. And photorespiration, of course, is going to, to occur. So as the concentration of O2 increases, concentration of CO2 decreases, photorespiration is favored over photosynthesis. And then the plants that live in hot, dry environments where photorespiration is, is especially a big problem, um, what we see is lots of plants over millions of years of evolution have developed mechanisms that will prevent photorespiration from happening. Some examples of plants like this are uh, plants that are called C4 plants and then uh, CAM plants. And because it consumes, photorespiration consumes ATP and does not produce glucose, there's a strong selective pressure against that um, process. And that has favored the proliferation of adaptations that increase the evolutionary fitness of organisms who possess those adaptations. So what I really want to stress is how adaptations come to exist. Because what we see with evolutionary adaptations is that a mutation occurs and that can increase or decrease an organism's chance of survival if, it, uh, if that mutation allows the organism that possesses it to reproduce more than other members of their population then the mutation is seen as being favorable through natural selection and typically will become more common 
in the population as organisms that possess that favorable mutation uh, survive and reproduce at higher rates than members of the population who don't possess that uh, adaptation. So having this uh, mechanism for preventing photorespiration is not due to a plant's desire but is instead due to um, millions of years of evolutionary adaptations that have been passed down due to genetic mutations in, um, in a plant line. So it's not a choice, it's not a matter of homeostasis, it's simply a matter of whether or not that uh, plant's species as a whole has, um, has specific genes that allow it to um, undergo a different process in order to increase photosynthesis as opposed to photorespiration when those plants are living in hot, dry climates. So this video here is uh, basically talking about the difference between the way in which C3 plants and C4 plants um, uh, undergo uh, photorespiration and photosynthesis. And I'll explain what a C3 plant and a C4 plant are right now. C3 plants are typically known as the ones that are normal, quote unquote. But there's no such thing as normal in biology. It just doesn't exist. There's no such thing as normal in life. Um, what I would like for you to know about C3 plants is that they are performing the light reactions in the Calvin cycle in the mesophyll cells of the leaves. So those are the cells that typically have the highest concentration of chloroplasts. And um, that is where their photosynthesis is going on. The, I want to point out these bundle sheath cells that wrap around the xylem and phloem. Those bundle sheath cells in C3 plants don't contain chloroplasts. However, in C4 plants, they do. So in C4 and, and CAM plants, um, what you should know is that they have a modified process of photo, uh, photosynthesis that allow them to prevent photorespiration. And the way that they do that is C3, C4 plants actually perform the Calvin cycle in a different location within the leaf than the C3 plants do. And CAM plants, uh, they obtain their CO2 at a different time than C3 plants. And so the biggest difference between C4 and CAM plants compared to C3 plants is that they separate the initial fixation of carbon dioxide from the using of carbon dioxide in the Calvin cycle. And uh, the way that they do that is by using an enzyme that's different than Rubisco. They use this enzyme that's called PEP carboxylase, and they're able to fix CO2 in spite of a relatively high concentration of oxygen. And the reason for that is because this PEP carboxylase enzyme actually likes CO2. It has a higher affinity for CO2 than it does for oxygen. And so um, they are going to typically use the CO2 that comes into their cells um, instead of the carbon, uh, instead of the oxygen, simply because the enzyme favors CO2 more than the oxygen, as opposed to the Rubisco enzyme that uh, just uses whatever is in higher concentration. So let's go into C4 plants. C4 plants um, are, for example, corn, sugarcane, um, sorghum, those are all examples of, of C4 photosynthesizing plants. And the CO2 in those plants is transferred from the mesophyll cells to actually the bundle sheath cells where they cannot escape. So they're being stored in this impermeable membrane um, that won't allow them to exit the bundle sheath cells once they're put in there. And this actually increases the concentration of CO2. And so that will favor the Calvin cycle over photorespiration. And they will start to photosynthesize in, in the same way, uh, mostly the same way as uh, the C3 plants. And the reason why that can happen in these C4 plants is because the bundle sheath cells of C4 plants do actually contain chloroplasts. Whereas in C3 plants, the bundle sheath don't contain the chloroplasts. And so by shuttling the CO2 into the bundle sheath cells from which the CO2 can escape, that concentration is increased 
and that leads to the joining of CO2 to the RUBP and the resultant production of organic compounds through the Calvin cycle. And they use this pathway that's called the Hatch-Slack pathway, and that is what's occurring prior to the Calvin cycle. And so they take this enzyme, PEP carboxylase, it adds the carbon dioxide to this starting material known as PEP, which is a three carbon compound, and this happens in the mesophyll cells. And as a result of combining that carbon in the carbon dioxide with the PEP molecule, we produce this four carbon compound, which explains why it's called C4 photosynthesis, and the four carbon compound then moves into the bundle sheath cells via these um, openings called plasmodesmata, which are just small openings that allow for cells to attach to each other. The four carbon uh, molecule goes into the bundle sheath cells. But once they're there, they're locked there. They cannot exit uh, the bundle sheath cells. And as a result, the CO2 is then released and the Calvin cycle can begin. Um, and so I have a, a quick question. Why, if the hatch slack pathway prevent, uh, helps to prevent photorespiration, why wouldn't all plants have this type of adaptation? And the reason for this is really twofold. The biochemical pathway exists only in plants whose ancestors had a mutation that caused that adaptation, which turns out to be favorable, favorable to them. You have to remember that organisms can't simply choose which pathway to use. They're at the mercy, whether that be for better or for worse, of their species evolutionary history. So if their ancestors had the adaptations, the mutations that caused them to be able to do this pathway, had this, um, this peps, PEP carboxylase enzyme, then they could do the pathway. If not, then they of course couldn't do the pathway. It's not a matter of choice. And the second reason is that the hatch slack uh, pathway utilized by the C4 plants actually requires the use of additional ATP. It's required for the conversion of pyruvate to this PEP. That is in addition to the ATP that's required already to drive the Calvin cycle. And so plants who utilize the hatch slack pathway, they have to pay for its use through the additional um, energy that's not required by the C3 plants. However, in those, in these plants, I, I would say that the cost of the additional ATP to prevent photorespiration is worth it um, due, to the, due, to where they're, due to where they're at, due to their dry location. Um, so it's, it's a matter of payoff. C3 plants, yeah, of course they don't have to undergo this additional step using this PEP carboxylase, uh, but the, the C3 plants also don't have to pay for that step with additional ATP. So uh, it, the hatch slack pathway requires more ATP and you're not trans, um, you're not uh, photo respiring, but the C3 plants don't need to spend uh, excess ATP if, if they're not in an environment that is dry and would be uh, beneficial for them to do this pathway in. And then C, uh, the CAM plants also have a pathway for, for doing this. And the way that they do it is um, that they open their stomata at night in order to obtain the CO2 and release any um, O2 byproducts. And CAM4 plants are typically like the succulent plants like cacti, pineapple. Those are the, the plants that are gonna open their stomata at night. And one benefit in doing that is, is that they um, are opening their stomata at a time when it's cooler and when it's not as dry as the, the daytime. And this prevents them from drying out and keeping their stomata closed. Because during the daytime, it's probably the hottest and driest part of the day. So if they only open it at night, they're preventing a lot of um, transpiration of the, of the water. And uh, that's going to save... Um, save them in the long run in terms of being able to photosynthesize. And so the, um, when the stomata are opened at night, the CO2 is converted to an organic acid, and it's through this C4 pathway that you don't really need to know about, and then it's stored overnight. Um, the Calvin cycle is not performed at night by this, the, the CAM plants or any other plants, 
and it's impossible for the Calvin cycle, excuse me, to occur at night because, or in the dark, because ATP and NADPH that are products of the light reactions are required in order to run the Calvin cycle. So if it's dark, they wouldn't be able to undergo the, the Calvin cycle. And so instead, the CAM plants store their CO2 as, as part of a malic acid. So they store it in this organic acid that's known as malic acid overnight until it can be released and used when the light reactions start again during the lighted hours. Um, and even though the CO2 is taken in at night, the Calvin cycle cannot occur because those light reactions um, can't, can't go on in the dark. They require... Um, they require light in order to get them started. So this is just a, a quick diagram. You can you can pause it and take a look, just describing the difference between uh, what's going on really with um, cam plans. And then this last one is um, describing uh, compare. It's showing a comparison between C3 plants, C4 plants, and cam plants. And um, you can see C3 is the one that we've we've described in detail. C4 plants are when the gases are exchanged through slightly open stomata, um, but they require additional ATP because of this additional enzyme, PEP carboxylase, um, that's going to push the 4-carbon uh, sugar into the bundle sheath cells and store it there to then force it to undergo uh, cell, uh, photosynthesis as opposed to photorespiration. And then that stuff is going to be used in the Calvin cycle, just like it would normally be, and we're going to produce the sugar or the G3P at the end. And then the CAM photosynthesis is when gases are exchanged um, through the stomata only at night. And then uh, the carbon uptake requires some additional energy. And then during the daytime, it requires some additional energy to turn it into malic acid for storage overnight. And then once the light comes out in the, in the daytime, then that malic acid can be reconverted back to a product that can be sent through the Calvin, Calvin cycle to produce the glucose at the end. Um, advantages of C4 and CAM, water loss is minimized. Disadvantages is that they typically require a lot more energy. And in the CAM plants, it slows the growth because that's uh, the CO2 is only coming into the plant at nighttime and where we have a lot more steps in terms of conversion to something that can be put through the Calvin cycle as opposed to C3 and C4 plants. So if you have questions, like I said, please come and contact me, uh, send me an email, visit during community time or break, and I'd be happy to help you.